This is the first time I have set foot on a college campus in California since I was fired from UCLA in June of 1970. to be able to speak here in California, in Southern California, in Orange County. <laughs> the script that Angela Davis gave us in 1972 to fight forms of oppression and repression in the United States and the many forms that it comes in, from racism to structural racism to class to our prison system to the military industrial complex um, to wealth inequality. She talks about all of those things in 1972 at CSUF to our former students, you know, to students who could have very well been us. The major problem we are confronting today, the major problem people throughout this country are confronting is the problem of racism. We have to begin to understand that all of these things affect all of us. And we have to talk about establishing the greatest most invulnerable kind of unity. I feel like we didn't heed those warnings then and we're living with those repercussions now. When she's talking and warning about our massive problem with racism and fascism and the like, um, her words are still relevant today. We have to march on with the unshakable confidence that we will win our fight for a new Society, our fight for a society where freedom, justice, equality, abundance, dignity, and happiness belongs to all. Thank you very much. Thank you all for doing that. Um, before we continue, I'd like for all of us to participate in a deep grounding exercise. So in a few moments, I'll invite us all to take four deep breaths together so we can be here present in a moment and kind of prepare ourselves. Ready? Thank you and for, for um, doing that with us together. Um, today we have with us two ASL interpreters who will be interpreting the live parts of the program, while the footage of Dr. Davis, of Dr. Davis's lecture will be shown in closed captioning. Their names are Alina Serrano and Jason Johnson. Right click. Um, so Lena's bio. Lina Serrano is an American Sign Language interpreter working in the field since 2002. She has her national certification through the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, primarily for interpreting work. Oh, primarily, her interpreting work is in education, but her background varies interpreting through her freelance business in the medical field, theatrical, and legal. She, is currently, she currently is a staff member at California State Fullerton, University of Fullerton and Long Beach, as well as Long Beach Unified School District. Her physical description is, Lena Serrano has long dark hair, wears pink metallic frame glasses, and is currently wearing a black blouse and a black sweater. For Jason's bio, Jason is a 22-year-old sign language interpreter who has been signing for almost 10 years now. After graduating from Golden West College, where he trained to become an interpreter, he now attends Arizona State University, majoring in musical theater and minoring in film and television. His background consists of a lot of music performance interpreting, as well as being a staff at Fullerton College and freelancing through several agencies. Jason's physical description is, Jason is brown skin with short um, black hair and black, black eyes. He has a slender athletic build and is 5'7". He is currently wearing a black short sleeve polo. Thank you both for being here with us today. We really appreciate y'all.
And I want to give a shout out to Dina Leisner and Camilla Parker from Disability Support Services, who helped us get connected with our ASL interpreters for this event. Also on deck, we have with us on this program for, um, folks from ASI and the Social Justice and Equity Commission, or ESHEC for short. Their names are Asha Nettles, Aisha Kawaja, Andrea Fausto, and Rebecca Hasgard. For Asha's bio, Asha Nettles is one of the coordinators for ASI and served as the advisor for the Social Justice Commission. Asha is a double alum of the CSU, earning both her bachelor's and master's. She is passionate about helping students find and thrive their individual advocacy journeys. For her physical description, Asha is brown skin with black individual braids and glasses. Today, she is wearing a blue t-shirt with text across the front. She will be our technical support for this event. If you have any issues or questions during the program, please feel free to message her privately. And Asha will introduce Aisha. Hi, everyone. Aisha is a senior here at CSUF and majoring in Human Commission Studies. She is also our Social Justice and Equity Commission coordinator working to create more social justice awareness and active change on campus. She is passionate about speaking up and working to help those who are marginalized and silenced in our society today. She's also a big fan of cats and hip hop. As for her physical description, Aisha is brown skin right now on the fairer side from being locked in the house. Um, she is black and purple hair and wears turquoise print glasses. Today, she is wearing a black long sleeve shirt. I shall be introducing Andrea. All right. Hi, everyone. Andrea is a Cal State Los Angeles uh, alum and a current graduate student at Cal State Fullerton. As a graduate assistant for ASI's leader and program development office, she works directly with SJEC and our environmental social committee. Um, she works enjoying, she enjoys working with student leaders and is passionate about providing guidance and support to assist students in reaching their full potential. And for her physical description, Andrea is light skinned with brown round eyes and medium length curly brown hair. Today she is wearing a lavender shirt and white guard earrings. Hi everyone, I will be introducing Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is a CSUF alum and a current graduate assistant for ASI's leader and program development office. She primarily works with student leaders doing advocacy work around civic engagement and is passionate about working in partnership with students to facilitate their leadership growth. Um, as for her physical description, Rebecca is light skinned with almond eyes and medium length short brown hair. She wears glasses that help her see, but also complement her round face and thicker build. Today, she was wearing a white shirt. Hi, everyone. Today, I'll be introducing Janica. Janica is a queer Panay activist and journalist who serves as ASI's Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer, Tusk Magazine Social Justice and Black Voices Editor, and DJ Soul Boogie hosting Solidarity Radio for Titan Radio. She is a double major in American Studies and Communications with a concentration in Journalism, and a double minor in English and Women and Gender Studies who hopes to continue shaking shit up. Her physical description is she's a fleshful panai on the lighter side with hella long black hair and dimples that appear sporadically. Most days she's rocking all black clothes from head to toe with a warm smile and kind eyes to greet folks. Today, Janica is wearing a black Hell State Fullerton sweater and will likely pull her hair back into a ponytail at some point during this event. Thank you for the introduction, Rebecca. Um, finally, for our co-moderators, we have two amazing females, Dr. Maylene Malone and Darius Falk. For Darius Falk's bio, Darius Falk is an American Studies graduate student at CISA who is an advocate for the humanity that can be found in all of us. Darius is an old soul born anew, a lover of poetry, language, and bringing the funk. He was one of the original columnists for Tusk Black Voices at Tusk Magazine and hopes to continue to spread love and joy through a variety of creative pursuits. Darius is, oh, for his physical description, Darius is brown skin, tall, and lanky as hell. He is in his mid 20s, has short um, black hair and a laid back demeanor on this otherwise engaged in a philo philosophical debate. Today, Darius, wearing, Darius is wearing a long tanned sleeve shirt. Um, so up first we have Darius who will provide us with some context for our program. Hello and thank you everyone for joining our black history event, Angela Davis tried to warn us. I know we had some hiccups in the beginning, but the spirit of this event is positivity and love. So we're not gonna let that get us down and we're gonna have a great time today. I'm so excited to be here today to celebrate black history and specifically the contributions of one Miss Angela Yvonne Davis. 
to the fight against depression and the many forms that it can be found around the globe. Last semester, after a summer of watching the world rise up to fight the inhumanity that is racism and police brutality, I was reminded that Ms. Davis once united the world around the very, these very same issues. In 1969, she was fired from her position as an assistant professor at UCLA in large part due to the actions of the then governor of California. That governor would eventually become president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, a former B-list actor who rose to political fame by being a racist. Sound familiar? Less than a year later, Ms. Davis would find herself on the FBI's most, top 10 most wanted list and was charged with a murder and kidnapping that she did not commit. Her arrest sparked a global grassroots organizational effort for her freedom and for the freedom of all political prisoners. Local committees formed in over 65 countries to advocate for her freedom. With the help of these grassroots activists, Ms. Davis was released from prison on bail after spending 16 months incarcerated. In June of 1972, she won her freedom back after an all white jury found her not guilty on the charges of murder, kidnapping and conspiracy. Not five months after being acquitted, Ms. Davis was here at CSUF speaking to us. The world of 1972 is not much different from the country that we inhabit today. The United States was engaged in forever wars in faraway countries. Politicians were engaging in corrupt behavior while trying to disenfranchise voters of color after the, after the political gains of the mid 1960s. Prisons were filling up, the environment was being deregulated, levels of in, income inequality were peaking, people were dying and suffering. And Ms. Davis explained all of it to us. She advocated against oppression and repression with love and empathy. Ms. Davis came to see stuff and tried to warn us. She is returning here today so that we might accomplish what we failed to do in 1972. It is my pleasure to introduce the amazing Professor Milang Malone, whose contributions to my article in this event cannot go unexpressed. Professor Mulang Malone teaches African American studies at CSUF and advises the Afro Ethnic Student Association on campus. She believes in the power of collective organizing, self determination, and community, and in self reflection, self love, healing, and finding inner peace. Professor Malone envisions a world without prisons, a world where human needs are more important than profit, a world premised on compassion and mindfulness. She lives in Inglewood with her two sons and loves nature, Frank Ocean, and coffee. Physical description, Professor Malone is brown skin with dark hair, average height, smaller build, and in her 30s. Today, Dr. Malone is wearing a t-shirt that says teaching is political. Thank you so much, Darius. Um, and my apologies, there's some construction happening um, at the building next to mine. So as life would have it, of course. Um, anyways, hello. Um, as you heard, I am Mailing Malone. It is such an honor to introduce you all to Dr. Angela Davis, one of my all time favorite humans. Uh, for me, she's right up there with my two sons, Asada Shakur and James Baldwin. Um, so for a while, I couldn't even bring myself to write this intro. I just felt uh, intimidated and incapable of truly capturing the vastness of her leadership, visionary thinking, her courage and fighting spirit. Um, but I'm gonna show up and do this introduction anyways, um, and just let it be enough. Um, and I owe it to my time in therapy for allowing me to adopt that approach to life. Um, so who is Angela Davis? Angela Davis is an activist, scholar, and author. Angela Davis represents new possibilities and hope. Angela Davis is inspiration. Angela Davis is resistance. Angela Davis is love. Angela Davis is life. 
She was born on January 26, 1944 in Birmingham, Alabama. She grew up in a middle-class neighborhood dubbed Dynamite Hill due to many of the African-American homes in the area that were bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. Davis later moved north and went to Brandeis University where she studied philosophy. As a graduate student at the University of California, San Diego in the late 1960s, she spent most of her time working with the Che Lumumba Club, which was an all black branch of the Communist Party. She was eventually hired to teach at UCLA and later falsely arrested and imprisoned for a year and a half, which Darius just beautifully explained. After spending time traveling and lecturing, Davis eventually returned to teaching. She was a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she taught courses on the history of consciousness, retiring in 2008. Davis has continued to lecture at many universities discussing issues regarding race, the criminal justice system, and women's rights. Known for her books like Women, Race, and Class and Are Prisons Obsolete, she is also a co-founder of Critical Resistance, an organization that aims to end the prison industrial complex. Dr. Davis advocates gender equity, prison abolition, and alliances across color lines and grassroots organizing and hasn't missed a single beat in the struggle for true liberation her whole life and counting. It makes me emotional to think about Dr. Davis and how she gave up the opportunity to have a quiet and comfortable life as an academic. Instead, she's been spending her life unapologetically calling out capitalism, racism, and fascism, finding herself at odds with her place of employment, the state, and our larger white supremacist power structure, forced to become a so-called fugitive and even being in prison for some of her precious life. I am just so thankful for her courage, her refusal to be silent or complacent regarding matters of injustice and human rights, risking her very livelihood for the greater good. She is all that I aspire to be. Because of her example, I know that it is necessary for me too to jeopardize my own livelihood when necessary and whenever the very lives of any human beings are at stake. Her wisdom, her critique of power and oppression is right on target and unfortunately timeless, it seems. My only hope is that um, more people read her work, study her life, and dare to be as brave as she is in the struggle for a more humane world. Listening to her words spoken in 1972 on our campus together over Zoom is a great start. And I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts and questions and having a very meaningful dialogue afterwards. I hope this event inspires you today and for all the days to come. We'll go ahead and play the video now, please. Before I get started, I want to thank all of you who participated in the vast national and international movement that demanded and secured my freedom. I recognize that had not it been for the efforts of thousands and millions of people throughout the world, I would not be standing here speaking to you this evening. This is the first time I have set foot on a college campus in California since I was fired from UCLA in June of 1970. It's a particular pleasure for me to be here this evening since shortly after my acquittal, Ronald Reagan made it known that he was going to do everything within his power to bar me not only from UCLA, but from the entire college and university system here in California. So it gives me a kind of uh, pleasure that uh, people have refused in many ways to be accomplices 
of the kind of thing that Ronald Reagan is trying to push around. This is also an event which has a particular importance for me to be able to speak here in California, in Southern California, in Orange County. <laughs> a victory in light of the mudslide re-election of Richard Nixon. <laughs> Most people call it a landslide victory, but I think it was a mudslide of racism and reaction. <laughs> the topic of this event is very timely and very appropriate, oppression and repression in the United States. The major problem we are confronting today, the major problem people throughout this country are confronting is the problem of racism. And I think that if the last four years are any indication of what is to come during the next four years, we can indeed predict a very catastrophic period within the history of this country. Black and brown and Asian and Native American people have always been the first victims of oppression and repression in this country. But I think that white people in this country, particularly white working people, should begin to understand that they too are exploited and they too can be victims of repression. On many occasions in the past, and especially during the, this recent period after the election, I have used the word fascism. I have talked about an increasingly fascist danger which people in this country must begin to come to grips with. Some people have accused me of using rhetoric which doesn't have any basis in reality. But I think that we have to be very serious during these very critical moments. We have to understand that there is indeed a very real danger, menace of fascism in the United States today. I do not think that we have already entered into a period of full-blown fascism because fascism is not something that suddenly explodes and erupts into being. If we look back into the history of the world, if we look at countries like Germany, Spain, Italy, we see that fascism is a process. It's something that grows and develops. It's like a cancer. It starts attacking one group of people, but like a cancer, it begins to spread out with a fatal rapidity, and eventually, like a cancer, it destroys everything around it. Once fascism does consolidate itself, and I think, again, we have to look towards the past, look at those countries where fascism did develop into its full-blown state. Once it's happened, there is no possibility of resisting it and defeating it from within. Look at what happened to Germany. Look at Italy. It was always defeated from without. 
And I would ask you to tell me one thing, if you can conceive of such a fascist order developing in this country, who would liberate us? Who would be able to liberate a country whose government possesses enough weaponry and enough nuclear capability to destroy every single person in the world many times over? And I know many of you probably do not agree with me that we are embarking upon a period which could lead in the direction of fascism. But I would urge upon you to weigh what I'm going to say very seriously, because your fate may very well, well depend upon it. If we look to fascist countries in the past, one of the things that becomes very clear is that the government or the class in power has always sought ways and means to divide the people. And when you talk about divide and rule, divide and conquer, that's one of the age-old strategic themes, themes of oppressors and exploiters. And it's within this context that I want to say a few words about racism. Racism as it affects, in the first place, black people, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, Native American, Asians. And racism as it also affects those white people who become its unwilling, unwitting pawns, its unwitting weapons, its unwitting instruments. I don't think that too many people would disagree that there was indeed a lot of racism in Tricky Dick Nixon's campaign. That indeed, I don't think that very few, very many people would disagree that there was some kind of attempt to pit white people against black people. Look at the statement that he made about busing. And look what followed that statement. The events in Canarsie, New York, Brooklyn, where white adults threw stones. We're going to have right on, sister, and we're going to have a question and answer period as soon as I finish this presentation. Okay, right on. In Canarsie, New York, white adults threw stones at black and Puerto Rican children and threw eggs in their faces, spat on them, and called them all kinds of vicious, racist names. And I think we have to understand the connection between that statement that Nixon had made only a short while previous to that and what happened in Canarsie. And I think we have to understand the connection between the kinds of things that Richard Nixon has been saying and what happened yesterday at Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. that precisely at this moment we appear to be returning back to Little Rock, Arkansas. We are returning back to Orangeburg because Orangeburg seceded tent. You know, black students had been killed already in a protest situation before the students at Kent State were killed, but because of the racism that is so deeply embedded in this country, the reaction came only when white students were killed. <laughs> but let's try to understand, first of all, what racism is all about. Let's try to understand its source and who it benefits. 
Because I maintain that racism does not benefit the masses of white people and that white people have just as much an interest in fighting racism as black people and Chicanos and Puerto Ricans and Native Americans and Asians. And <laughs> First of all, let's ask ourselves, who does racism aid? And I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that the beneficiaries of racism are not the masses of white people, but the vast capitalist corporations in this country. And you see, when I talk about capitalists, I'm not talking about the small businessman, the person who has a corner drugstore, a corner grocery store. See, that's what Richard Nixon wants us to think black capitalism is all about. But you see, capitalism today, when we talk about capitalism today, we have to look toward the General Motors, the Standard Oil, the it and T, the General Electric, the Bank of America, and I could go on and on. But actually, I couldn't go that far because the number of people in this country who control the majority of the wealth is extremely minute. If you take the hundred largest corporations in this country, they already control 50% of the wealth. And then you take the 200 largest, and you find out that they control practically uh, all except 15% of the wealth in this country. But then 70% of all income taxes are paid by working people. Does that sound right? Sounds like there's something wrong with that. But let me try to explain for a moment how racism affects people of color and black people, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, and all people of color in this country. If you take working people of color, And if you compare the wages which we receive to the wages which white workers doing the very same jobs, and I'm using government statistics, statistics that the government has given us, you find that there is a $28 million differential. That is to say, black people, black people, alone account for a $21 billion super profit. And so I'm talking about the profits that, that the capitalists get over and above what they would get if there were one. But then if you add Chicanos and, and, and Native Americans and Puerto Ricans and all other people of color in this country, you end up with $28 million in extra profit that the capitalists put in their pockets just because of the existence of racism. Just because of the existence of racism. And that's a lot of money because we could buy a lot of houses and build a lot of schools and a lot of childcare centers and a lot of the things that we need in the ghetto and the barrio with that $28 million. <laughs> But you see, racism serves yet another function, and that is the disruptive, this divisive function. Because you have a situation where while white workers can rant and rave about black workers, that makes them forget that the exploiter is also on their backs too. And what it does is it destroys the possibility of creating a movement that's going to be able to overturn the exploiter. And that's the divide and rule function. If we look again towards the past, back into the past, if we look at Nazi Germany, 
we can see that the function of racism can be very similar to the function of anti-Semitism in promoting and encouraging fascism and allowing fascism to develop to its full-blown state. Because you see, while the masses of Germans were being busy being anti-Semitic, the German capitalists were squeezing more sweat and blood out of them. And if white people don't watch out in this country, that is exactly what is going to happen. Because there's already been the wage freeze. And there's already been this massive unemployment. And there's already been the assault on the work on workers' right to strike. So we have to try to put all of these things together to see where we're going. But let's try to look at what is happening in this country today. Let's try to talk about some of the real indications of a developing fascism. We already mentioned what happened in Canarsie. We already mentioned what happened in Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana yesterday. But let's try to put some of this into context. And let's talk about what Nixon consciously did in modeling his election campaign. His election campaign was modeled along the most blatantly racist issues that we have seen in recent years. And you see, a lot of people wondered why George Wallace didn't run this year. He probably would have gotten far more sympathy in this present state than four years ago. But I think that there is no doubt about the fact that Nixon, Richard Nixon, demonstrated that he is not only George Wallace's bedfellow, but that in a lot of ways he knows how to out Wallace Wallace. See, in a lot of ways, the Nixon is a little bit more clever, a little bit shrewder than George Wallace, so he can get much further. But there is something else which points to what I would call a racist conspiracy from the very, very high ranks of the ruling powers of this country. And what is that? I know a lot of us kept waiting for George McGovern to say something about the need to respond to what was happening in the ghettos and the barrios. And we kept waiting. And we heard Nixon and all of, all of his racist nonsense. And we were wondering whether or not George McGovern was going to say something about that, whether he was going to at least challenge him in words. But in a lot of ways, he was silent. He was either silent or he went into Chicago and made a deal with Richard Daly, with the Daly machine. And if anybody symbolizes racism in the Midwest, it's the Daily Machine. <laughs> and that also meant at least implicit support for Hanrahan, who was a part of that whole slate. And we know what Hanrahan is all about. Because an official investigative commission confirmed that Hanrahan definitely had something to do with ordering the attack, which led to the murder and cold blood of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark as they slept in their beds. But I think the failure of McGovern to 
at least verbalize a forthright challenge to racism indicates that we will indeed be facing very serious days ahead. As I said earlier, we can look back over the last four years as we try to predict what we're going to face these next four years. And what I've tried to do is to look at, try to understand what happened in, in, in Germany prior to the Nazi seizure of power, prior to the Nazi seizure of power. And one of the things I've looked at is this judicial system prior to fascist Germany. And I noticed some very, very frightening parallels between the deterioration of the judicial system in pre-Nazi Germany. I'm stressing this, pre-Nazi Germany, before Hitler seized power. There's some very frightening parallels between what was going on there then and what is going on here now. Once upon a time, the jury system in this country was supposed to be one of the most important institutions of democracy in this country. Once upon a time. But the Supreme Court has recently ruled that you don't have to have 12 individuals totally convinced that you were guilty in order to be convicted can be nine, can be eight. Have you ever seen that movie, 12 Angry Men? Where one man who believes in the innocence of the person who's on trial succeeds in convincing all 11 others that he indeed is right. But you see, this doesn't exist. In two states already, this doesn't exist anymore. And, and I'm sure that the rest of the states are going to begin to follow suit very soon. But what does this mean in terms of this racist offensive? It means that if you have a situation where a black person or Chicano person is on trial, and you're in a county where the most you can hope for is maybe one or two or three blacks or Chicanos on the jury, that means that whatever input they might have will be totally canceled out. And see, you remember what happened with Bowie's case, how he was tried on three different occasions, and there were hung juries. And as a result of that, they had to dismiss the trial because the charges, it was obvious that the racism and the bias of, of jurors was preventing a just verdict from coming forth. But you see, that won't exist anymore because the Supreme Court has now ruled that you don't need 12, you only need, who knows, it may be two or three after a while. But you see, this, 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 is, this, this is what I'm talking about when I say fascism is something that, that begins, and it might look very small, but it spreads and it develops and before you know it, it has crept up behind you and there is nothing more you can do. And if you don't start fighting it, when you can look at it and isolate it and try to cut out the cancer, it will have strangled everything around it and there will be no more hope. But let's look at the, let's look at further examples of this encroaching fascism, creeping fascism. There's something called the Rodino Bill, which is now before Congress. And what does that say? That says that every person who is working and who might possibly be considered a foreigner has to have papers or else that person can be deported. 
And we see particularly in this area, in Southern California, it's used against Chicanos. And it's not only used against Chicanos who do not have papers, but it's something that can be used against Chicano political activists because they can very easily set you up and say that you don't have papers and ship you out of the country. We have to begin to understand that all of these things affect all of us. And we have to talk about establishing the greatest, most invulnerable kind of unity. Black and brown unity, black and brown and white unity when it's a question of progressive white people who understand what is happening, who are willing to struggle against it. Because that is the only solution. Unity. Unity. And let me tell you, let, let me just give you what I feel is the most stunning example of that kind of unity to have emerged in this country in recent years. And I'm talking about the brothers at Attica. The brothers at Attica really got it together. Black prisoners, Puerto Rican prisoners, white prisoners stood united. And it was because of that unity that Rockefeller sent in all the police in the area the military, too, and probably would have gone in himself if he hadn't been afraid. <laughs> they fear that unity. The oppressor, the repressor, the exploiter. But we have to counter all attempts to pit black people against brown people, brown people against black people. Because you see, one of the things that they do in order to, to divide the movement and to disrupt any attempt to build this unity is they'll tell, they'll tell Chicanos well, black people have eaten all of the pie and there isn't any left for you. And then they'll tell black people, Chicanos have eaten all the pie and there isn't any left for you. <laughs> and we know that they tell white workers, you better watch out for that black worker who's trying to get your job. Let me give you another, another very clear, very obvious example of those attempts to dis divide and disrupt. And I'm talking about all of Nixon's pronouncements about welfare. You know, he's been ranting and raving about welfare recipients, parasites, living off the taxes of working people. But let's, let's look at what the real facts are. Let's look, let's look at the breakdown. First of all, whenever they talk about welfare recipients, they are implying, if they do not say so explicitly, black people and brown people. But you know, 55% of the people on welfare in this country are white. 55%. And then they talk about the draining of the federal budget. But less than 4% of the federal budget is spent on welfare in the first place. Welfare is the most inhumane kind of system in this country, the most racist. But, but, but let's, let's, Let's compare this $7.8 billion that comes out of the federal budget for welfare to the $120 billion defense budget. What does it mean? It 
If anything is blamed in the taxes of the people in this country, it's the war in Indochina. And that potential war that they're trying to build up in South Africa and elsewhere in Africa where our sisters and brothers are struggling for their liberation. But getting back to the question of welfare, let me just tell you who is on welfare. You said, first of all, that 55% of the people on welfare are white. Let's look at the breakdown of the categories of welfare recipients. Now, 24% are old age recipients. And you see, Nixon kept talking about all these lazy, shiftless black and brown people who don't want to work. Okay, 24% are age or old age recipients. 8% are permanently and totally disabled, so they can't work. 1% are blind. 50.3% are children. 2.9% are incapacitated parents in homes. 13.13% are mothers. And one fifth of that 13% are mothers are in job training. Or they are employed already and are making so little money that they have to resort to welfare in order to survive. <laughs> so you end up with 0.8%, 8 tenths of 1% who are able-bodied men who are also seeking jobs. So what is all of this work ethic that Nixon has been talking about? This laziness. It's obvious that it's just an attempt to create a hysterical racist atmosphere in this country so that you end up with a situation like what happened at Southern University yesterday when two black students were killed. I would like to move briefly into another area, an area where you find many, many symptoms of creeping fascism. And that's the area of political prisoners. And this is something that I feel very close to because I know what it is like to be a political prisoner. And after I was acquitted, I committed myself to devoting all of my time and energy towards building a movement to free all political prisoners. <laughs> all political prisoners and victims of racist repression in this country. And we don't have to look very far at all if we want to know where some of the political prisoners in this country are. I know I don't have to look very far because my former co-defendant, Michelle McGee, is awaiting trial in San Quentin prison. And we have to talk about the San Quentin Six. Do you know who the San Quentin Six are? Because I think it's a shame that communication is so difficult because everybody should know the names of the San Quentin Six. Do you remember what happened on August 21st, 1971 in San Quentin prison when George Jackson was assassinated by San Quentin guards? We see it's the same story. They try to cover up for their own misdoing by shoving the entire load on our back. And so they indicted six brothers with a whole string of charges. They just don't stop. Among those six brothers is Fleeta Drumgo. 
And you see, Fleeta has already been acquitted as a Soledad brother. But because they couldn't get him with that frame up charge, they pinned another one on him. So we have to fight for the freedom of the San Quentin State. And there's Gary Lawson. Do you know who Gary Lawson is? You really should. Because the incident with which he is charged took place in Riverside, California. And that's not too far away from here. His trial is taking place at this very moment, he's being charged with the killing of two policemen. And you see, the witness, the witness to that incident said that Gary Lawson didn't look anything like the person who had killed the policeman. Yet and still, Gary Lawson was a political activist. He was a brother who spoke up for the rights of black people who struggled, and as soon as they found something they could use to set him up, they tried to railroad him right through to the gas chamber. And we still have to talk about the possibility of the gas chamber. Because one of the things that happened during that mudslide, mudslide re-election of Richard Nixon was that people in this state voted to reinstate the death penalty. And then we have to talk about three brothers like Los Tres. In Southern California, brothers who were involved in the anti-drug movement, like H. Rap Brown. And you see, they are charged, they were charged with the shooting of a federal agent who apparently was not just posing as a heroin pusher, but was actually selling it in the black and Chicano community. They've been sentenced to 45 years, 25 years, and 10 years. And see, I've just given you a few names from California. It's just a small fraction of the political prisoners here in California today. And it's just a grain of sand, not even a grain of sand, when you consider the national situation. Because I've recently been on tour talking about the need to build a defense movement to defend these sisters and brothers. And we're in the process of building that movement now. And I'd just like you to know that the honorarium I'm receiving for speaking here this evening, as has been the case at every other college campus, is going into a defense fund to free all political prisoners. <laughs> but we must recognize that racism is not only confined to this country, we see the tentacles of U.S. racism reaching throughout the globe. Could any of you in this room conceive of the United States government waging war on a people in a white country and killing and maiming six million people in the most incredible kind of genocidal aggression that history has ever seen? Could you conceive of that having been imposed upon a white country? Is it possible in this day and age? But you see, that's what racism is all about. And racism is Richard Nixon telling the people of this country that the war is winding down because the U.S. soldiers are coming home. It's all right for the Vietnamese to continue to be killed from those 155 extra B-52s he sent in when he pulled the troops out. Because you see, there were only 45 before. So the number went up from 45 to 200 during the de-escalation. And the tactical, number of tactical planes went up from 350 to 1,200 during the de-escalation. And during the de-escalation, 
Over 100 child care centers and nurseries were bombed in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. During the de-escalation, 60 schools and vocational institutions were bombed. And the banks were bombed during the de-escalation. And not only were the bank banks bombed, but when men and women and children went to repair the dikes, they dropped anti-personnel bombs on them. And you see, that's racism for Richard Nixon to be able to persuade the majority of white people in this country that the war was winding down. Let's talk about something that's, that gives us a little more courage and a little more hope. On November 14th, three days ago, a very stunning people's victory was won. Billy Dean Smith was set free at last. <laughs> the eyes of thousands of people throughout the world were focused on his court martial. And they simply would not allow our brother to be railroaded because of his opposition to the war. And there was a very hard fight, both inside the courtroom and out. And see, I think it's important to recognize that this is a black man speaking, a black man who understands that a victory for the people in Vietnam will be a victory for all oppressed people here in this country and everywhere in the world. said that the blood of nearly six million Vietnamese has seeped into the soil of rice fields which will never grow again. And the gouged out trenches of a devastated land run red with the life substance of a people who would be free had they not been made scapegoats in this vicious war game which would be fascists choose to play at their expense. I now wish to dedicate says Billy Dean Smith, the rest of my life to working towards guaranteeing that other persons like myself will not have to be subjected to the injustices I face in both the military and courts throughout the country. I commit myself to working for the freedom of all political prisoners. <laughs> I want to say a few brief words in conclusion. I realize that I have been speaking longer than the time allotted me, so I will hurry and continue. <laughs> we must understand that here in the United States, we have already entered into one of the most critical periods of the history of this country. There is ever-increasing racism. Racism is indeed the key problem faced by the people of this country. And the threat of fascism is growing. The threat of fascism is growing because on front throughout the world, U.S. imperialism is being beaten down. U.S. imperialism no longer has a free ticket to exploit our sisters and brothers in the liberated portions of Mozambique and in the liberated portions of Guinea-Bissau and Angola and in Namibia, in Namibia and South Africa and Zimbabwe. Our sisters and brothers are waging a very fierce struggle. But precisely because the United States government and its overlords, the capitalists, the vast corporations are being challenged on more fronts every day, they try to make working people pay for their setbacks to God, and particularly black people and Puerto Ricans and Chicanos. We are indeed in a critical period. For we stand at a crossroads. And at that crossroads, one sign points to the future. It points to a future 
where there is no more want, no more exploitation, no more wars, no more racism. Black people, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, Asians, Native Americans, and progressive whites are carrying the banner of that new society. And we have friends and allies all over the globe, wherever there are struggles being waged against U.S. period. But we stand at a crossroads, and the other sign points backward into a dreaded era of more blatant racism, more cruel exploitation, and more fatal repression. That sign points towards the dungeons, the concentration camps, and perhaps eventually towards nuclear destruction. Richard Nixon and his cohorts are carrying the banner for this direction. He is carrying the banner for his overlords in the capitalist corporations whose eyes are trained on a single thing, a single goal, profit, 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 and more profit. And he is trying his best to recruit the masses of white people to march backwards behind him into that dreaded era of fascism. He is trying to recruit the masses of white people as his pawn, and he is trying to make people of color his scapegoats. So we must ask ourselves today, which path are we going to take, sisters and brothers? Which path are we going to take? That is up to us for our future. And I'm talking about all of us, all different colors. But I'm not talking about all classes because there's one class that has to be overturned if we're going to fill that new society. <laughs> our future will be a function, a direct function of our ability to struggle vigorously and to recruit ever more people into the ranks of our march. History so it is being shown throughout the world is on our side. So let me conclude by saying that we have to march on with the unshakable confidence that we will win our fight for a new society, our fight for a society where freedom, justice, equality, abundance, dignity, and happiness belong to all. Thank you very much. Welcome back, folks. Uh, now that we're um, almost back, I'd like for us to take two more deep breaths so we can settle in. Ready? Oh, do we have the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Ready? Thank you. Okay, some quick housekeeping rules um, to just, just go over. Um, if you wish to speak or ask a question verbally, please raise your blue hand function in the Zoom. And if you do not wish to speak, please type your question or comments in the chat. We'll be monitoring the order and we'll address each one accordingly. Another quick note, um, please be mindful of our community guidelines, which are to speak respectfully and to use inclusive language and to respect the one mic, one, one voice rule so please keep yourself muted until you, it is your turn to speak. At this time, Darius and Dr. Malone will be co-moderating in conversation with y'all, starting with some questions we have for you, the audience. The first one I would like to pose is, um, what are some of the par parallels you notice from then to today in the video? I'll give a few people a few moments to um, 
come up with some of the answers or put them in the chat. Sorry, we have one from Arila. Uh, Asha, can we unmute uh, Arila, please? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I definitely think one of the parallels that I saw was just when she was talking about um, capitalism, um, just and I feel like nothing she was saying was anything different from today. And I do think that it's just gotten worse. Like, and I think that is just the case with capitalism in general, like it just has gotten so much more sensationalized. And I think um, with the influence of social media these days, I feel like capitalism is like romanticized in this weird way. Um, I know that there are so many people that are anti-capitalist on social media, but I do think this concept of of um, influencers and just kind of like media in general has uh, skewed what capitalism is like um, in comparison to what it was in the 70s to now. Like I, I definitely think it's worse, it's, it's worse, but then it's also so interesting too because she says something about how it's so, so vast, but it's not at all because it is this small group of, of, of people that carry on these huge corporations and and they're just getting all of this wealth it's not like m tons of people are these like multi-millionaires it's like this small group of the one per like it's the one percent that like keep getting the one percent it's like that quote where it's like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer like that's literally all it is and so i think that was an interesting parallel because i don't think anything's really changed it's um well maybe it has in the case of that it's just gotten worse Thank you for sharing, Ariba. I appreciate that. And then we have um, Artist Knox. Can we unmute our, um, Artist Knox, please? Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ariba. That was very insightful. You know, my, my, one of my issues is like I hear people talking about you know, the social change and how they want to fix what's going on with America. But like things that they suggest is just like putting a bandaid on the bullet wound because the whole concept behind the founding of America was the exploitation of, of humans for a resource. And the whole basis of capitalism is to have an unlimited supply meeting unlimited demand, which is impossible to sustain unless you cannibalize your own citizens. You know, so somebody in the system of capitalism, somebody has to be at the bottom and someone has to be at the top and those at the top fight to sustain their position and they do it by any means necessary. So like um, what we're facing is like a global dilemma as to will we're, how we'll proceed. Are we gonna proceed with this, this capitalist mindset which is going to eventually cause things to implode in the destruction, I think, of humanity itself. Or are we going to be willing to, to admit that this whole foundational uh, financial system, social system has been undergirded by white supremacy? And Neely Fuller has said, if you don't understand what white supremacy is, what it does, what it is, and how it affects you, everything you think you know about white supremacy is, is null. So if we don't understand what white supremacy really, really is, at the core, we're just going to be running around in circles. And no matter who's in office, whether they're Black or Latino, they're still going to be promoting the same system that created this whole structure in the first place. Thank you. Uh, very well said. Uh, is there anybody else? Who, thank you so much. Is there anybody else who would like to contribute? Oh, I think. Uh, Kira Kenty, we, we um, unmute them, please. 
Um, first, I want to thank both of y'all who spoke before. Though that was really insightful. It really, really made me think a lot more. Um, I want to say two of the parallels that I saw. One was the similarities between Trump and Nixon. For myself personally, I didn't know um, where Nixon, like Nixon's background per se, you know, in that him and Trump were so similar and coming from like more of an entertainment type business and both being Republicans. So that was really um, interesting and something nice for me to learn. But then another parallel I will say is how um, Angela Davis talked about the government wanting to keep um, ethnicities and groups apart. And how she was saying, like, in order for anything to change, you know, we need to come together. And I think I really agree with that. I feel like for so long, we try to interact as like individual people or individual groups in this world, and it hasn't worked. And so I feel like, like she said, I think if we could all just realize that there's one common goal, and if we could come together to reach that common goal, you know, maybe some things to start to shift. That was great. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Um, do we have um, any others before we um, continue the conversation? All right, cool. Yeah, um, Darius or Dr. Malone, how would you like to respond to that in terms of this lecture and 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 Davis and what we can um, learn from that? Um, so I just want to quickly touch bases on all those answers because they were all so amazing. Um, Abria, when you were talking about social media and capitalism, it reminded me after or during the George Floyd protest when the Black Square on Instagram became popular and these large corporations started posting that Black Square on Instagram and show of like support. And to me, that was like a major instance of like systems trying to co-opt movement from the people to try and defuse it. So um, that was a great point that you mentioned. Um, artists, and when you mentioned that uh, most of the solutions that we come up with are band-aids over bullet wounds, um, first of all, beautifully said. And second, that is one of my biggest frustrations that I try to, to tell people when they complain about um, like petty crime and I go, if you want to get rid of crime, you have to end poverty. There's like the, a direct correlation between the two of them. And, you know, it's not, the answer isn't more police officers. You know, the answer isn't this, that, the other. It's, it's poverty. You want to do something productive, we should really work to end poverty. Um, and so I really appreciate you mentioning that. And Kyra, um, the separation of government and the people or the government trying to separate people is so prominent. I, you know, kind of in the idea that we, they simply like categorize us to begin with, you know what I mean? They start to make us view ourselves as not connected to one, one another. Um, yeah, we have our individual identities and we have group identities, but that doesn't mean that they should be separations, you know what I mean? Those should be bonds that we grow together with. Um, so I really appreciate all those answers and um, they really got me thinking. I was taking so many notes, so thank you. Um, I feel like you guys don't need me at all, first of all, <laughs> between um, folks answering and Darius, I really appreciate and agree with uh, what folks are saying. I like that people are highlighting capitalism first and foremost, like capitalism is a full on cancer that is destructive and that is at the core of our violent and humane society. So I think it's exciting that no one is trying to be like, it's cool, we can try to like get some reforms or try to make it a little bit better. Um, I like that we're just saying like, we can't live in a society where there's vacant homes and homeless people, where people die simply because they cannot afford, afford the medication that they need to live when it's available, but they're too poor. Like that's just an out. Um, so I love Angela Davis because um she is trying to get us past getting stuck in reform like artist was talking about that's why like looking at radically restructuring our power oppressive power structures is what we really need to be doing and that's why i appreciate like what everybody is saying and all the like things that trickle down the having us beef with each other the way that poor whites are exploited and they have hard lives too um, so let me stop rambling there and we can go to the next question. 
Um, well, the next question is for y'all. What were some parallels that y'all saw that weren't um, necessarily touched on? <laughs> Sorry, I picked up that on. I think the biggest thing that jumped out to me was her discussion of fascism in the United States. Um, to me, that seemed like such a contemporary issue, you know, like this new grown th threat of fascism in the United States. And I watched a video, I was like, man, <laughs> we've been fighting this for, you know, 50 plus years in the United States in various forms. Um, and so that was a big one to me, it was just like that general discussion that there's always been like this creeping underbelly of fascism in the United States. Man, uh, I think at one point she said concentration camps and then my heart just kind of like froze a little bit thinking about ICE and separating families and um, putting children behind bars. Um, but I also think about our ongoing lack of imagination of other um, just ways of structuring society. So I think about the ways in which we look at police brutality and we think we just need to reform the police and we ignore this growing um, rising critical mass of folks that are calling for dismantling and abolishing police and we're not really recognizing that as legitimate. So thinking about all these issues that she's talking about in 1972 warning us massive problems with racism, capitalist exploitation, violence and that we continue to proceed as normal. So it's just really discouraging. Thinking about the ways that um, death by cop is a, um, what is it? One of the leading causes of death for black men. And yet here we are like, let's, it's cool. We'll just keep the police system. Um, so I just feel like everything, literally everything she's saying is just, really, really relevant today. Thank you. Um, and then since y'all answered that question, I'd like to um, turn it all around to the audience and what are your responses to the parallels that uh, Darius and, and Dr. Malone were talking about? If you have, if you want to contribute, if you have any, if you want to contribute. Danica, there's also a comment in the chat that oh. Nathan just posted. Oh, let me read that. Thank you for that, uh, Andrea. Uh, Nadine said, um, what struck me also was her comment about the deterioration of the judicial system in pre-Nazi Germany and how the judicial system here in the U.S. was probably the only thing standing between us and a full slide into fascism. If the judges uh, had enrolled in favor of our free and fair election, uh, Trump would have succeeded in holding on to the office um, by force. Yes. Thank you for sharing that, Nadine. Um, any comments? I had actually written that down too, again, while I was watching it. And again, it reminded me that fascism isn't individual actions or actors, it's systematic. Um, and the, the, the threat begins in a systematic way, I think much more so than, you know, the neo-fascists that we see walking around the United States today. Um, it is the judicial system. It is things like, um, oh, I forget the act off the top of my head right now, but um, the, the unlimited amount of money that we have in our political system, you know what I mean? And stuff like that is, um, is a big threat, so. And then is there anyone else that has a comment either on the parallels or um, commenting on what uh, Dr. Moon or Darius um, saw as parallels? Alrighty. Um, so now we've uh, kind of seen these things and why these parallels exist. Um, what are some things that we can do so that Dr. Davis's words no longer remain timeless? Um, I'll, I'll leave that to the audience first, and I'll give you all a few moments to think about that. Oh, boy. Um, we have artist Knox. Thank you. Uh, uh, I could be seen as an extremist, especially being a minister. <laughs> but I have extreme views on that because, you know, it's just like the whole thing when you're getting rid of cancer, they give you medicine that 
My mother struggled with cancer for about 19 years. Never give her this medicine that it would kill the good cells and the bad cells. But in order to get the bad cells, you know, you had to take this poison to like totally gut out everything. So what's necessary in America is to get rid of the poison that had created this belief system in the first place, which means you literally, the people are going to have to take America by force. You know, like Thomas Jefferson said, that, you know, tree of liberty has to be, you know, bathed with the blood of the patriots. Like, we don't have to necessarily die, but we have to become violent in a way where it's not hurting people, but taking a stand and refusing to accept anything else because those that are in power are a very small percentage. If just like 10% of the people rolls up and like did something about this, you know, it could change, but people have to be willing to, to make that step. So my whole theory is just a, a total revolution. Um, well, I see other hands, but I want I want to uh, give a chance for Darius and Dr. Malone to respond to that. I struggle with this. I don't. Okay, so I shouldn't say I struggle with the idea of revolution. I my biggest fear in terms of revolution is being corrupted by that anger. Um, I don't have an easy answer to this. I don't necessarily disagree that those are the steps that we need to take. Um, but personally, for somebody trying to engage the world um, in love and empathy, you know, there's a level of, of violence that is that can be corrupting. Um, and so I, we're still trying to figure this out. You know, we don't have any easy answers. I don't think there is any easy answers. Um, I think the biggest thing, or one of the biggest things that we can do is organize, organize, organize on um, the power of the collective. As you said, if 10% 10 10 of the population, you know, came together and organized, um, they could accomplish so much. And so, you know, it's a personal view. I don't want to, I don't want to discredit um, anybody or anything. And again, I, I, I get where that comes from. You know what I mean? It's, it's a visceral reaction when you face racism and oppression here in the United States of America. Um, but I don't want to fall corrupt to that same oppression and repression through, um, you know, like human to human violence. Um, but I also don't necessarily disagree with, um, you know, the actions that happened over the summer, you know what I mean? Like everything I think for the most part that happened over the summer in 2020, you know, is fair game. I think I, my biggest thing is people talking about property damage as violence. Um, property damage is violence against capitalism, <laughs> you know, but it is it's not violence against like individual people. Um, so those are, those are some thoughts. Um, so I'll try to jump in. I definitely, um, like they both just said, believe in the power of uh, mass organizing. So raising our critical consciousness is a great start. So even considering and daring to dream about radical alternatives and rejecting the structure as is, it's like, I think the first place, but also, um, just the power of the people, the power of communities to have self-determination. Like we have all the talents, passion, skills, education, intelligence that we need to do well and succeed and provide more humane services for each other. I think we discredit like the possibilities of what we can all do when we work together. So I, I just feel like there's so many different moving pieces that, and all are really valid and important. Um, but also just looking inward uh, and self-reflecting and thinking about how we want to relate to the world and relate to others in our daily life and embodying these practices of love and radical humanity and forgiveness and stop like the hate and the judge and the drama just like on an individual level. And I think the more of us that are um, committed to doing that, the more it's going to change the energy of society. We're just not going to be able to tolerate the violence and the hate and the exploitation. So those are just some, some brief thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, would you like to respond really quick, artist, or can we move on? 
Oh, uh, maybe on him, please. Or we can. Oh, okay. Yeah, th thank you for the opportunity to respond. Like, um, like I'm not a proponent for violence, but I am a proponent for resistance. You know, and um, rather the killing letter of revolution. You know, a revolution is just resisting anything that is causing you to feel like you're not living the life that you desire for yourself. You know, Gandhi, who King, you know, backed the whole civil rights movement on. Uh, he created a revolution when he was representing the sugar claim farmers who were being exploited, Indians who were being exploited. And King came on the back of that. You know, like Darius was saying, there has to be, you know, a resistance, but it doesn't have to result to the loss of life, which I don't promote. And I'm glad that was brought up. But I also believe in revolution and the fact that we have to literally stop. So I teach this course at my church called Stop. Uh, STLP strategically take our position. And what that does, you position yourself in what you believe, what you want on your life. And then you don't take anything else. And that is the revolution itself, because anytime someone comes with any other idea, structure, or movement, and it doesn't fit into what you're doing, eventually that will die off. And the collective, when they believe and promote what they're doing, like what we're doing now, then that builds and that spreads. And then all those other ideas, racism, white supremacy, that eventually starts to die out. But there has to be a revolution because we're just going to be fooling ourselves if we think that, you know, these make America great again, people are just going to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then uh, we have Ariva next. Can we unmute uh, Ariva, please? Oh, and thank you for waiting. And thank you for thank you, um, artists, for your contributions. Yeah, I thank you, everyone, for like everything's been said has been that has been said has been so insightful. And I think um, as I hear everything, one of the things that comes out to me the most is how important it is to unlearn a lot of the systems that have been forced on us for such a long time. And I think that um, that might be the best, or I mean, a step in the right direction to make sure that Dr. Davis's words aren't timeless. Like I think that um, even when it comes to people of color, like I've personally experienced not taking up the space that I deserve. And I know that so many other people of color um, experience the same thing. So going off of what was said about, you know, starting a revolution and it's also just like about making sure that we know that that we're worth the space that we want and it's even just like some because it is a simple it, it's a very simple concept right like we we are worth the life that we live and I think that that isn't something that a lot of POC are taught and and you know being in white spaces we're not really taught that and we're taught that we have to work really hard and we have to fight really hard um, and sometimes we're taught that it's not even worth it sometimes it's taught that this is just a fact of life and you just have to live through it I think about um, Hassan Minaj's um, comedy special where he says that like a lot of first generation like first generation kids are uh, fighting back because they have the audacity of equality like this country is all that we have and all that we know and and that's why we want to fight back a little bit harder the generations before us did or or um, just other things along the line of that and I think it's just kind of like not even just unlearning like how America as we know it is built in such a corrupt system that it's not even about fixing it it's about rebuilding it like it was built in a corrupt manner so therefore it isn't really valid I believe like I think that there are so many so many things that are corrupt within within our systems that like it's kind of too late to fix those things it's about creating new systems but then again it's also just about unlearning these things that have been pushed onto us and, the, and how we have been degraded for so long and how, you know, our, our parents and our grandparents and our ancestors have been degraded just because of the color of our skin. And I think it's about like unlearning those, all of that stigma that's also been like passed generationally through, um, through family. Like I, I, I'm a, I'm a child of immigrants. And so I know that there are definitely moments in my life when my parents are like, you're just being dramatic. This isn't that bad. Like this is just a fact of life. When it's it, when it isn't, it's not a fact of life. Like racism and um, systemic racism and anything institutional racism isn't and shouldn't be a fact of life. So just kind of learning to make sure that we that we deserve to be here. We deserve the life that we live. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you, um, Darius and Dr. Mo. Where to begin? Such a great answer. Um, I think unlearning is a good place to start, at least trying to unpack this for myself. Um, 
I was always kind of like told growing up to play the game, you know what I mean? To like try to conform to these notions so that you wouldn't be persecuted. And I think what excites me about the moment that we live in is I think people are feeling liberated to be them, their unapologetic selves. I think that is a big thing for me personally. And I think generally in the movement and the moment is this idea of being an unapologetic version of yourself, being true to who you are as a human being, regardless of where you come from, um, is a big step in helping, I think, everybody except like an unapologetic version of themselves. I'm really liking where um, this conversation has led us. I think we need to more and more look at like racism and capitalism, sexism, homophobia, and also like think about our personal wellness ideas and beliefs that we carry about ourselves because they're not disconnected. Like the mental health world and the social justice world aren't like far apart, they like are here. Um, so, I mean, I don't have anything to add. I just second this idea of finding your own worth, knowing that unapologetically and loving yourself. And then it, of course that's gonna like naturally lead into being kind to others, rejecting violence, not looking down upon other people you're gonna think like a farmer gets paid nothing and a doctor gets paid so much money. You're gonna think that's ridiculous because that is, because every human life is worthy. Every job has dignity. Um, and it also just makes me think of James Baldwin. Uh, he was like amazing at just reclaiming his humanity. He unapologetically, unapologetically said like, I'm not an N word, like that's your problem. That's your projection. That's something you need to work out. I am fully human, I am a man, it is what it is. And I think the more of us that can do that, um, the better it is for the world. Thank you. Um, we have Kara Kanti and then Mari next, but I will quickly read what April Blue wrote in the chat. Um, I think we start with our communities, um, have those tough conversations with people not here for these kind of courses to openly discuss and work towards fixing implicit biases and challenge and uh, that challenge the unity that Angela, that Angela Davis calls for. Thank you everyone. Uh, love all that I've learned today. No more internal impression, uh, oppression. Thank you very much. Um, we will respond to that as well as Kira's, um, Kira's or Kira's comment. Maybe uh, unmute her please. Thank you, and it's Kira. Um, but I kind of just, you know, just want to echo what was said um, already earlier, like what Dr. Malone said, just about going inside, you know, because literally we have the gift that this world needs. Like everybody in this, everybody that's in this world, in here for, you're here for a purpose, you know? So I think if we just can like, you know, really discover ourselves and discover what our true purpose is. And then kind of like Ariba was saying, um, changing those um, mindsets that we have, you know, breaking generational curses. And like uh, April was saying, having those conversations in our communities, because I think that's kind of where it starts first, right? It starts in yourself and then being able to share that with your family and with your friends and changing their mindsets. And then it's just going to continue with like a domino effect because what they learn from you, they're going to go share. You know, it's kind of like the each one teach one. So I kind of just like what everybody was saying, and I, I really like that. And Ariba, I really like what you said too about the, you know, like you are worth the life that you live. I've never heard that before, and I feel like that's really deep. And if people just hear that, maybe it, they'll change the way that they live or change their mindset, you know. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Kira. And then we'll hear from Mari, please. Okay, well, first of all, thank you everyone for organizing this. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our host, co host Like, this is an amazing event. And I think, you know, we need to have a lot more discussions like this. Um, but back to the question, I think that, I mean, this is just a completely new idea within myself for the last couple of months. And so I still have a lot to learn about institutions and systems. But I'm profoundly believing that the way that we start attacking all this is through um, 
education. And I mean, it was by chance that I was able to pursue it, like education past the high school, you know, public school system. And I found it very frustrating that it was only by chance that I came across um, like an ethnic studies course. And that just enlightened me into like, oh my God, there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we were never taught as, you know, kids. And, and there's so much that, you know, that's representing us in history. That's just not this predominant um, Anglo white male type of written history. And so I think that as I've, I've thought that, and as I, I've continued through um, my educational path, I think that it's just important for other people to be exposed to this, especially from a younger age, just because as you, you know, grow up, I feel like there are a lot of people who are very um, narrow minded, and they kind of don't want to accept something that they never learned as a child or, you know, as an adolescent. And so I think that we just need to break that cycle of people resisting to, you know, diversity and equity and all these, you know, just being progressive in the, and like a really great way that we can start that is by exposing this in curriculums in public schools throughout the nation and just pushing for that, um, that change. Thank you. Um. <laughs> um, any comments for um, Kira, Mari, or what April said? Mari, hi, first of all, hi. Um, I relate to the point you made so much. I think when I like my first couple years in undergrad, I didn't really feel like there was a place for me in the world because I didn't really see myself in a whole bunch of different places. I mean, it wasn't until, you know, got farther in education, started to unlearn things, as we discussed before, that I became more comfortable with myself um, and understanding, you know, exactly what we're facing in the world. And I think one thing to like my kind of think of and to think outside of the box and to think radically on this is we don't have to wait for K to through 12, you know, public schools to educate our children. Um, there's nothing stopping us from educating our children, the children that are in our lives, the children that we encounter and in our communities. Um, so I worked, you know, at a library for a, a while. And before COVID hit, um, I took like what we learned in American studies pedagogy to heart and try to, you know, take that to these kids. And it wasn't in a classroom and it wasn't in, you know, such a formal system, but I still try to educate them on, um, you know, what reality is like or what reality for them might be like. So um, great point. Thank you. Anything, Dr. Malone, or should, should I move on? We're almost done. We're about to wrap up. So we have one more person to, to go. Cool. Um, maybe let uh, Jehu speak or unmute. Hello. Nice. Oh, nice to meet you. Hello. My name is Jehu Jagwe. Uh, I'm an accounting finance major at the College of Business and Economics. And I bring a little bit of a different spin. Um, and I'm just curious, you guys bring up a lot of concepts or we're talking a lot about capitalism and the current system and how white supremacy uh is like an issue in that in that system without a doubt um and then a little bit of talk about resistance as well um and darius you just mentioned that seeing people like ourselves uh in in these places uh is there's like a lack of representation um especially where a lot of the money is allocated in the economy like if we're looking at some of the ceos of businesses they don't really represent people that look like us and that's just the capitalistic structure and my question really to to both you darius and um professor or dr malone is um do you guys see a chance for like a new movement in terms of kind of like the black wall street or something like of this nature popping up again in like a digital system where we're able to like reallocate some of the wealth. And also on top of that, um, I know like 
something that I've noticed just personally, uh, an observation is just right now with, I'm not sure if everyone knows what's happening with like GameStop and Reddit, how communities are being able to disrupt the financial system. And I'm just like curious to hear what you guys' like thoughts are on this and kind of like bridging these two worlds a little bit, so. Thank you for your perspective and your question. Yes, thank you. It was a great question. Um, I, I'm i all for the idea of radically reimagining how our world works, right? Like it obviously doesn't work for us now. And I don't think there is a limit to the possibilities. Like the limits are our imagination. We have to reimagine how this world works. So yes, can we redistribute, redistribute wealth through technology and social media? Um, yes, you see a lot, I think you would see a lot more um, small individual black owned businesses um, succeeding through platforms on social media. Um, I think that's a big step. Um, and even it, to expand it to like the arts and you know, the black renaissance is people creating on their own terms, you know, not necessarily waiting for these gatekeepers to let them in. And I don't think there's a reason why we couldn't work to reach that point um, in an economic sense. Um, yeah, I for, you talked about so much, it was so great, but um, that would be my, yeah, I don't think there's any reason to not think that we couldn't get to that point. Um, I think the GameStop thing in a vacuum is really cool, um, but like when we start to weave in, you know, all these systems of power, it's still kind of ended couple of people getting rich and maybe some rich people were less rich but I think there was a lot of normal people like us who probably ended up losing a lot of money in that game stock stock so I think maybe you know education and awareness I know a lot of people don't know how to invest their money um, in stocks or they have other people investing their money for them so they might make mistakes like buying game stock stock at five hundred dollars <laughs> um and so, yeah, so, it, it, you know, everything ties in together and there's no reason why, you know, if we, if we can imagine a world without police, there's no reason to not be able to imagine a world where we have a Black Wall Street and a Black Wall Street that's equitable for everybody. Um, so I can add my little two cents here. Thank you for your question. You look really familiar. I can't figure out like how I know your face. Um, but just to add on to what Darius is talking about, um, I like the idea of feeling empowered enough, having enough pride to think like we can have whatever everyone else has, like there's no um, limits to the possibilities for us. But I do want to just caution against this idea of like black capitalism then I would have to, not saying that you're saying that, but um, I know other people are saying that out in the world and that I would really caution against because any kind of exploitation or any kind of inequity or imbalance anywhere, just like the Black Panther said, they, they gave the best answers. They weren't for black capitalism either. They were against capitalism, period. So as long as it's about re, radically redistributing, redistributing wealth, um, and us all living well without exploiting or oppressing others, then like I am fully on board. Thank you, um, uh, Jehu and Dr. Um, Malone and Darius. Uh, we'll be wrapping up right now. I just wanna um, say thank you all for a beautiful conversation and empowering conversation. Thank you once again to our amazing moderators, Darius and Dr. Malone. Um, and thank you very much to our two amazing interpreters, uh, Lena and Jason, and much gratitude to SJEC and, and ESI crew supporting this event. I also wanna give a quick shout out to my dear friend and mentor, Maria Linares. Um, you are the best and I love you and your three royal dolls that you are mommy to. Um, so let's conclude by joining in a call and response chant from Asada Shakur, led by Darius. We, oh, yeah. All right, so. I know this is a virtual event, but I want all of Southern California, I want the whole world to hear and feel the love and passion that we have for one another. So I please repeat after me and scream it as loud as you can. All right, ready? It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is, it is our, our duty.
duty to fight, fight for our freedom. freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our, it is our, duty, duty, to our duty to win. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you can unmute yourselves. Sorry. We must love each other and support each other. We, we must, love, we love, must each love each other and, and support, support each, each other. other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Yeah, we, have we have nothing to, to, to lose but our, but our, chains. our chains. Thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you all to our amazing moderators, speakers, and the contributors and folks supporting on this call and meeting. Sorry it went super over and for the technical difficulties, but you know, we're human and it's expected. So much love to y'all and, and thank you for sharing the space with us. Okay. Uh,